Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for that we can come together as a uh, you know, cell group to just uh, hear from one another as well as also hear from Joshua. We just pray Lord, that even as Joshua shares, uh, may the Holy Spirit just guide him and anoint him through his life, how you have worked in his life. And we just uh, thank God for how you have blessed him with uh, a lot of resources and how he's using this to be a blessing to many other people as well. So we just ask Lord, that uh, Father, you just guide uh, all of us and uh, for this discussion and maybe we all be blessed and maybe we all be ministered and yeah, we just leave uh, this entire time with your hands. In Jesus' mm. name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, warm welcome to everyone once again to uh, our presentation. Um, so I, I have a, a, a little hobby uh, or ministry which I call Faith and Finance where I teach people how to uh, manage your money, probably faith-based, very faith-based. Uh, uh, brave faith based, uh -huh. So, okay, let's get started. Now, I'm going to, I have to do this because uh, I'm going to be talking about money, I'm talking about investing. So I need to provide some warnings and disclaimers. I'm not a financial advisor. So you do need to uh, seek your own financial advice before you do anything. And if you're watching the replay, you can literally pause and watch and, and read this um, at your own time, okay? Uh, in simple English, you know, basically investing is risky. So just, just be aware of that, all right? So let me start by introducing myself a little bit. Um, I moved to New Zealand sometime in January 2017. So it's been about four or five years now. And uh, that's my, that my family there. You can see my wife and three little kids. The, the kids are still kids, uh, but they have grown up a little bit since then. And one little uh, tidbit that, I've, that I would like to share about New Zealand is, you know, New Zealand is actually quite a, oh, it's got a lot of, it's got a much bigger land mass than Singapore, but it's actually a very tiny country. Uh, the pop, we have less people in New Zealand than Singapore, but yet, uh, it really punches above its weight in the sporting arena. So there was one time I was playing golf uh, at some charity event. And uh, so I was taking a picture with this, with this flag, right? The, the Olympic flag. They were raising money to, to send some of the young people to, to compete in the Olympics. And uh, so that, you see that gold, gold thing, uh, that gold medal I was holding. When I took the picture, I didn't realize that was an actual Olympic gold medal. Uh, it was worn by... Uh, Barbara Kendall for selling many, many years ago. And uh, interestingly, ever since I come, come to New Zealand, I've met quite a few uh, Olympic uh, gold medalists. Uh, these are some of them over the last uh, few years. So this is just a little introduction to who I am, uh, my journey. Uh, I'm quite a typical Singaporean. Uh, I've studied in, I've lived, I grew up in Singapore, uh, come from a very normal middle-class kind of family, uh, went to NTU, did accountancy, and then I got my uh, CFA, which is the designation for uh, investment professionals. And then I started my career with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, and I was an investment banker with Ross Charles, which is a uh, British uh, merchant bank. So if you look at this, right, I mean, academically, it looks uh, quite promising. And then uh, I also work for pretty decent companies as well. So my career path uh, looked quite uh, how do I say this? Promising, okay? Uh, if I had just continued on my career path, uh, it would have, I guess I would have been all right. But uh, unfortunately, I got bitten by the entrepreneurship bug, the investment bug, whatever you want to call it, at a, quite a young age. And somehow couldn't see myself uh, working for people for the rest of my life. And very interestingly, uh, this was, there was one time uh, I... <clears throat> I got to know my mentor, okay? I have, a, I have a mentor. And how I got to know him was he was sharing at a, a prayer meeting in my church. And as I was listening to him, uh, something about him struck me. And I, said, I just said in my heart, as a, I guess as a prayer, wow, I want to work for this guy one day. We didn't know each other, but through circumstances, through mutual friends, uh, somehow we got to know each other. And it was at a church camp I still remember, I can still vividly uh, imagine the scene uh, in my mind. Uh, it was a church camp and we, uh, so after the night service, right, uh, he said, okay, come, let's go for supper if you're free. So we did. 
we went for supper. It was it was at, it would have been in KL, I believe. So one of those hawker center things, uh, uh, open air. So we were just having supper, satay or whatever. Lah. And I don't, I re, he was telling me a lot of things, but the most important uh, piece of advice, right, that he gave me during that talk was this. He said, Joshua, you are very young. Don't ever get into debt. Because if you ever get into debt, right, uh, if your boss ever says jump, uh, if your boss ever asks you to jump, you only have one response. You cannot say anything else. Your only reply will be, yes, sir. How high? And if you think about it, right, once you are, once you have debt in your life, um, you, you almost be chained to your job because you'll be afraid that if you lose your job, you cannot pay for the debt, pay for the debt. And so it becomes a very vicious cycle and you're constantly wanting to earn a higher salary just so that you can service the debt. So this was uh, just a general piece of advice he gave me. Uh, he shared with me a lot of other things, but this was uh, one of the most memorable. And in my sharing today, I will be talking of a, 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 maybe some of the things that he shared with me, which I think are still applicable today and that which I would like to uh, share with you. So ever since that, that supper, uh, my journey has been, uh, I started doing some businesses, uh, I started investing both in the stock market and real estate, and I guess I got, it got to the stage where I could retire uh, at the age of 33. Now, you might think, wow, 33 is so young. Now, uh, retirement is a function of having enough, how I define retirement, uh, uh, is having enough passive income that it can pay for uh, all your expenses. So which means that if you don't have a very high expenses, you do not need a very high passive income. Obviously, if you live a very lavish lifestyle, then okay, you know, you need more uh, income. But uh, I'm quite a prudent person, so I don't have a lot of uh, expenses. My only sort of indulgence uh, uh, is I like to buy nice cars. Okay, <laughs> other than that, uh, I'm actually quite uh, prudent. So this is my, a bit of my myself. Uh, I, I've retired at the age of 33, but I still, uh, I'm still continuing to be a very active investor. Uh, I invest in the stock market quite actively. Uh, I buy real estate. Uh, I was just talking to a friend. I realized I've been buying one piece of real estate every year for the last few years. Uh, and each of them are multi-units. I tend to like to have uh, multi-units in each, in each property that I buy. So this is what I've been doing for the last uh, few years. And now you may be thinking, right, I mean, faith and finance, uh, where, where is the faith coming in? So, and I understand from Mark that you guys have been reading through the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I've read it many times, obviously. Now, the, each time I think about the book of Ecclesiastes, right, the, I always go to the last chapter first because that's where uh, Solomon sort of starts, summarizes the whole book, right? And he talks about how at the end of the day, uh, everything that we do is pretty meaningless. And the most important thing is to fear God and keep his commandments for this is the duty of mankind. You can read this in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12. So every time I, I want to read, I say, oh, just to remind myself that, yeah, it's meaningless you know, to, to try and chase wealth or uh, to, to chase things. But you know, I don't think that's how God created us though. Remember when God created Adam and Eve, um, he had one command for them. He said, go and multiply and subdue the earth. That was his command to mankind. It was not for them to just stay in the Garden of Eden and just eat fruits every day uh, and just enjoy themselves. They had a uh, command which was to multiply and subdue the earth. Now, subduing the earth, there is, you know, there's a lot more theology behind it. I won't go into it. But what, we, what I mean to say is that you, know, you and I, we actually do have a, uh, shall I say, calling and mission, uh, and it's not to not do anything, okay? The book of Ecclesiastes is not to tell us to just not do anything and just coast. Uh, I'll give my take about Ecclesiastes more later. And I contrast this uh, with a, you know, in the book of uh, Mark, where, you know, the rich young ruler, I was just reading through this, in fact, this very passage, just maybe two, three weeks ago, because I've been reading through the Gospels recently for my quiet time. Uh, and 
the, the words that Jesus said, right, struck me with this. He says in verse 27, he says, with man, uh, this is impossible, but not with God. So essentially, they're talking about how it's impossible to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, and Jesus was telling them that with man, this is impossible, but not with God. So with God, it's possible, right? So what I think Jesus, the, the contrast I'm trying to, to share with you is this. Solomon and the rich young ruler, by the words that they were using, right, were essentially trying to say, I can do it, you know. Uh, I can do this myself. I can do it. But Jesus is basically saying it is impossible. Only God can do it. And at the end of the day, right, it is not about whether you are rich or poor. Uh, it really is about our heart. And I think the best example that we can live for would be from the book of Ruth. You know, the, the, there was this guy called Boaz. Uh, he was able to, he was in a position because where he was wealthy enough, uh, he was in a position to be able to provide for Ruth. And I believe that it was not only Ruth that he was providing for. It was actually a lot of uh, other widows and uh, people who, who needed uh, help. Because in those days, right, uh, the, the law for the land was that if you are a landowner, don't try to take every single piece of a harvest. Okay, leave some for the widower, leave some for the stranger, leave some for the people who come by. So basically, you be, be a blessing, right? So I would like to encourage you that you know, I'm going to share with you certain uh, sort of strategies and I won't call them tips, but little, little things that you could do uh, to get yourself in the position where at least you can um, get towards financial freedom. Now, the reason we do that, right, is not just for ourselves or uh, for, to, for our families, but it really is to be a Boaz, uh, to be a person who not, who not only is um, taking care of yourself, or not me, myself only, but be in a position where you can help others as well. Okay, so you can be a Boaz. Uh, I recently wrote a series of what I call Roof Truths, so bite-sized sort of truths uh, from the book of Roof, uh, and it's all on my website. So if you're interested, you can go and, and read. Uh, it's all written there. So this is the this is the uh, roof truths, okay? Now, okay. So what are some some things I would tell myself uh, if I could go back in time? I tried to make it catchy, you know, like ten things I would tell myself. And then as I prepared, the, as I was preparing this PowerPoint, I okay, no, I cannot squeeze into ten. Uh, so I think I end up with twelve or thirteen, something like that. But I think at the end of the day, right? Uh, as the, my my main thing is I want it to be useful for you. Uh, these are little, uh, little things that I hope that you can take away and will be practical, okay? Oh, by the way, if you guys have any questions, uh, uh, feel free to pop into the chat box. Uh, I can, I can uh, uh, respond to them. So what I did, okay, you know, remember my mentor, right? I told you, um, see, I must say uh, he's really a very uh, wise man. He's very driven for sure. Uh, he's very, he's a super high performer, uh, he's a great entrepreneur. He's also a great investor as well. Um, so, but we would regularly have lunch together, whether it's in the office or wherever. And what I did was I went to buy a, a notebook. Uh, I called my little black book and I would write down a lot of the lessons that he was trying to uh, teach me. Okay, so, so this, is the, <laughs> this is not the literal book, but uh, it really looks very similar. So I'm going to start off, uh, some, of, some of what I'm going to share today is from the Little Black Book and some are what, you know, I've learned over the last, what, 25 years or so and uh, what you can take from, okay? So the first, one of the most important things that he taught me is this, okay? I choose the person, not the pay. Um, what I mean by this is this, you guys are all very young, right? You are just graduated or something. Uh, when I was very young, uh, when I was trying to choose my first job, right? Honestly, I'll be frank with you. Uh, I graduated in the midst of the Asian financial crisis. You guys are not old enough to know what that is about. Uh, essentially, the I, I, I felt that it was worse than the GFC because Asia was the epicenter. Uh, it started with the Thai butt uh, crashing and then Indonesia, the Philippines, the whole, whole of Asia was in a terrible state. And a lot of companies were not hiring. There was a very severe recession for the whole of Asia. Your parents will know about this. So they were, I was just graduating right in the eye of the storm. And because nobody was hiring, right? 
uh, I was, I, I had a few job offers, but honestly, I was I had chosen my job based on which was which guy was paying me the most. And I kind of regretted that. So if I if I can go back in time, right? Um, I think it's very important when you select whatever job you want to do. I don't even think that it's about passion, but rather it's about the person. Who are you going to work for? And this person they're going to work for, right? Um, is this somebody that you can really learn from? Is it, you know, roughly in the industry that you or uh, sector that you want to uh, grow in? Uh, so choose the right person uh, and just pray, you know, pray and ask the Lord to, to direct you in this, in, this, uh, in this path. Now, I know that it may not be practical for all of you to be able to choose the best person to work for, even if you can't, right? Try to find a mentor uh, as early as you can in your life. You know, in your church, I'm sure there will be people, just pray, you know, pray and ask the Lord for it. Uh, he will send, you know, He will point you uh, to some people who can be your mentor, okay? So, essentially find a mentor, lah, huh? uh, and treat your, treat your, you know, I said in the words that your job is an IHL. What I mean is this, after you've graduated, um, you actually don't stop learning. Your job is an IHL, meaning that it's an institute of higher learning as well. So treat your job not just as a place for you to uh, be paid, but treat it as a place where you can learn as much as you can. So don't, so don't worry about the pay, no matter how much you are being paid. Focus on how much you can learn from the job or from the person you're going to be reporting to. Okay, so that's the, that's the first thing I would tell myself. Um, the second thing I would tell myself would be focus. Whatever you choose to do, make sure you're laser focused on that one thing. Uh, you know, in hunting, right? You know, all the animals that you have, you have watched on National Geographic or whatever, when they hunt, right, they, they just lock onto the prey and they just go after it uh, with all their almost all their hustle and mind, you know? So I think in whatever you choose to do, you must focus uh, because when you focus, you then somehow some, something will happen in your mind to force us to really figure, okay, if I want to be a salesperson or if I want to be an engineer or if I want to be a teacher, whatever you are choosing, make sure you focus on that one thing and just go after it, okay? Um, keep turning the stones. This is something that I learned from my mentor. Uh, in terms of, especially in terms of sales, right? Or whatever you're researching. So for me, because I'm an investor, I keep turning the stones, what I mean. Uh, uh, I'm always researching and I'm always looking at companies. What are the, what is the next hidden gem? You know, uh, let's say there's one gold coin or a treasure under one of the stones you can see uh, under all these stones. So you got to turn a lot of stones though because you don't know where the treasure is, but it's under one of them. So you do need to keep turning the stones because you do not know whether what you're looking for, the breakthrough that you're looking for, could it be under the very next stone that you're going to overturn? Okay, so keep turning the stones and don't give up. Uh, next one is something that I learned from uh, Pastor Edmund Chan. I don't know, guys, if you, uh, don't know if you have heard of him. He used to be the senior pastor at... Uh, covenant evan evangelical. I think he still preaches. If I'm not wrong, I haven't heard him for a long time now. And they do that. They have a big conference every year. I uh, can't remember the name of that conference, but he said this many years ago, and I still remember until this day. He said, "Think big, start small, and build deep." So we're talking about focus. You know, that's that's all that is about. Part of like building deep, uh, building strong foundations. Uh, and, and But when you start, right, you know, you don't have to start with a grand big thing. Just start with whatever you have, uh, whether it's the two mics in your hand or whatever God has given you, just start small. But even as you start small, right, think big, okay? Because God can bring the increase. So uh, that's one other thing that I will talk about. So you see, what I've been, the four, three or four points I've been sharing so far sort of relate to your career or business or uh, when you are first starting out, okay? So that's how I will pack uh, those, that group of what I call um, advice. Next, right, I'm going to be starting to talk about, a little bit about money. And one of the most important 
and it's common sense, but it is it is the truth, and it is uh it's something that is everybody can do, okay, which is to live below your means. Uh, don't fall into ego traps. What do I mean by ego traps? Uh? Um, back, back, back when I became, well, for lack of a better word, um, wealthier and could afford the services of a private banker, um, that was a very seductive, um, how should I say? It was a very seductive uh, thing to, to have a private banker. Uh, it's almost a, I don't know, badge of honor or, or something. But I tell you, at the end of the day, uh, it is only a fig leaf. Okay, what do I mean by fig leaf? Remember Adam and Eve when they sin and then they take the fig leaf and try to sew, uh, sew it into uh, something to cover up their, their shame. You know, each of us as uh, human beings, right, we're all fallen, right? So we still have that remnants of that shame in us that we, we have some kind of shame that we like to cover up and we do it through various means, okay? So your fig leaf and my fig leaf will be different. Um, some people like to buy nice cars, some people like to buy fancy houses. So we all have different fig leaves, but they are basically used to cover up the shame that we feel. And the reason we feel the shame is because somehow, even if some even for believers, uh, uh, because it's a journey, uh, they haven't got to them, gotten to the place where they really know how much God loves them. So it's hard for them to uh, really experience that love. So they still have remnants of fig leaves that they use. And, and I bring this thing about fig leaves is because a lot of times how we spend our money often is a fig leaf. You know, we, we try to we splurge or we try to keep up with uh, what, our colleagues are doing or you know what we see our neighbors are doing oh he's got a nicer car so i also must buy a nicer car we do little little things like that to make ourselves feel good uh, so that's what i mean by don't fall into ego traps um, don't so just be aware of that because once you start living beyond your means um what was that what is that phrase you know if you it's, it's just mathematics right if you spend more than you earn then at some point in time you will get into trouble Okay, so the secret, secret to financial freedom is very simple. If you, as long as you do these three things, uh, it's hard uh, not to be financially free. Okay, so live below your means. I've already talked about it. Don't get into debt. I've already talked about it. And the last thing is invest the surplus. Because if you do these three, uh, once you live below your means, by definition, you earn more than you spend. So that difference, which is a surplus, you know, obviously after tithing and all that, uh, you go and invest it. That's where you can then start to generate uh, future wealth. And most people, especially now that, you know, I'm 47 and I think back to when I'm say 25, 26, the, the power of compounding uh, is something that we know in our head but it's not something that we truly grasp, okay? Let me give you an example. I don't know if you have uh, paper lying around. Um, now, if you take an A4 piece of paper and try to fold it, okay? Uh, my ICACD, I tried to reach for a piece of paper. So whatever, okay? A, I think A4 is about, is about, right? Now, what you do is you fold, fold the A4, okay? So if let's say, uh, okay, I've got a piece of paper, my children doing things here. If you fold it, right? This is considered one time, okay? If you fold a paper once, this is once. Fold it again, this is twice. Fold it again, this is three times, okay? Now, what I would like to do is try to fold it 50 times. And tell me, uh, uh, what do you think by the time you have folded it 50 times, how, what do you think the distance will be? Okay, or how, how, thick, how thick do you think this paper will be? Anyone want to, want to guess? I've tried it, huh? I, I actually can't even fold it more than 10 times. It's physically not possible. But if, if assuming that it's possible, uh, and don't Google answer, okay? But if you, if you, if you can uh, play along with me, uh, take a guess, okay? How thick do you think this piece of, I don't know if you can still call it paper will be, if you fold it 50 times. I've only folded it maybe six times and I can't bend it anymore. Uh, but if you could fold it 50 times, how thick do you think it will be? 
Okay, Mark uh, types, uh, Hui Shun says 7 cm. Uh, Mark says 10 cm. Okay, those of you who are on Facebook Live, uh, if you could play along as well, um, I, I will not give you the answer yet. Let me see if there's anyone else on uh, Facebook Live who is typing the answer. Okay, let me just quickly check. Uh, okay, anyone else? Make a guess, make a guess. Whether, whether because if you, if you guess, right, then it will make, you, you will be, you will wow you more, okay, when I review the answer. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, you guys are, okay, Ying Xian says two to the power of 50. Uh, Joel says two, I guess, to the power of 50 times sickness. <laughs> Ying Xian says no calculator here, okay. I recall Mythbusters could only reach not more than 11 foes. Yeah, I, I couldn't go more than seven. Uh, I, I, it's physically not possible after seven, six or seven times. Okay, the answer is this, okay? If you can fold an A4 piece of paper 50 times, okay, five zero, you'll be from here to the sun. Mind boggling, right? And that is the power of compounding. If you can double and double and double and double, this thing becomes so thick that it will go from the earth to the sun. I, uh, I, I tried to do the mathematics um, <laughs> I, I research, but apparently this is the answer, okay? So what, <clears throat> so what I want, want to introduce to you is, the, is that once you can compile, um, it really is very, very mind boggling. Why, right? You have, uh, you would have read many parables about how, you know, this guy plays chess with the king and the king said, okay, I want to pay you. But I say, and the guy said, okay, just pay me one grain of sand, but you double up every, on the chessboard, right? You double up the number of grains of sand, uh, every square that we move. So the first few times, uh, the first few doubling is almost meaningless. But I tell you, by the time it gets um, got to the near the end of the chessboard, the king was bankrupted. So this is the power of uh, compounding. And why this is important to understand when you are young, because what you have that I don't have is that you are 25 and I'm not. So you have 25 extra years compared to me. And that 25 extra years, uh, I tell you, is very powerful. If you let time and the power of compounding work in your favor. Because once you can once you can make that happen, right, you will no longer be get to you will get to a stage where you no longer have to work for money and you can have money working for you. And very importantly, uh, I like to measure money, uh, not just as money, no, I like to measure money in time. So when money is working for you, when you're working for money, right? Let's say you are working for your boss, you are on hourly wage or whatever, as long as you are working, you can earn money. So you're selling time for money. But when money is working for you, uh, you're no longer constrained by time because your, 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 um, whatever you earn is not constrained by how much time you have. So the amount of money you can earn becomes theoretically limitless, all right? So I want to emphasize, uh, so if I could go back in time, uh, this would be one of the biggest sort of lessons I will hammer into my personal mind uh, that make time work for you, okay? Make money work for you. So how, the question then is, how do you let that happen, right? Now, the other thing I would tell myself is to find a great company and just hold on for dear life. Um, back when I was young, you know, the concept of um, investing in the index or dollar cost averaging wasn't new. Uh, there were, it was already available. So that was what I, I used to do, but I also did a lot of value investing. So I'll find undervalued real estate, I'll find undervalued uh, stocks. Uh, I've found so many uh, over the years and that's how I've made my money. Uh, and obviously in my career, I've done well as well. So, so the typical thing that you will hear a lot of people say is to just invest in the stock market via the index. So say an ETF, for example. Um, now this is the... Are you guys familiar with this thing called S&P 500? Uh, Straits Times Index, I'm assuming you had heard before. It's a collection of the maybe 30, excuse me, um, 30 or 35 biggest Singapore companies uh, listed on the stock exchange in Singapore. So the S&P 500 would be 500 of the largest uh, US companies. 
Now, although they are US companies, companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, they are actually quite global. So they do business all around the world. So it is not quite US centric. They're just large US companies, but they might have operations overseas as well. So this is probably one of the easiest ways that people talk about you know, investing in the index. And if you can invest in the index over time, you can see on the chart from left to right, you can see that you know, it has gone, it has done very well over time. Now, at the same time, if you look at the chart, right, you can see that there are dips, okay? And there have been occasions in the past where uh, the most, before the, you guys all know about COVID, but before COVID, there was this thing called Black Monday in 1987. I'm guessing none of you were born yet, uh, the, whereby I think the market collapsed 20, 25% or so in one, uh, in one day. That's why I call it Black Monday. So if you, if you think about such a terrible time in history and you fast forward, right? Can you just go back in time, right? In 1987, while if you were investing in the stock market, uh, how you would have felt. And not only Black Monday, uh, uh, if you were born in the early 1900s, you would have had to go through World War One, World War Two, you know, all the different wars, uh, Gulf War, Korean War, all sorts of war. Lah, huh? uh, Revelation talk about a lot of uh, rumors of war and then actual wars and then SARS and COVID. So all this would have impacted the stock market. But when you look at the actual, when you go back to the graph again, huh? if I ask you to point out to me, you know, the Black Monday when the stock market collapsed by 25% in one day, huh? Uh, would you be able to point it out? You know, just visually looking at this, without looking at the dates below, would you be able to point to me where was this Black Monday? Okay, you can take, I'll give you five seconds. You just visually, okay, roughly see, okay, where you think the Black Monday might have occurred, okay? And then I'll tell you where it is. Okay, the answer is here. Okay, it is a sharp drop, right? But on hindsight, yeah, we look back at it, it's not that big a deal. So I, what I'm trying to say is that when you invest in the stock market, if, as long as you can hold a, a long in long term view, uh, you'll be all right. Okay, this was Black Monday, and then this was the GFC, which is probably the most significant um, uh, what I call it correction in our our day. Um, but you know, even since then, right, because COVID, the market collapsed very quickly as well, but it's all also all recovered already. So, in hindsight, right, if you can invest for the long term, some of these blips will actually look like inconsequential. So as long as you can hold for the long term. Now, so, so investing in the index, uh, say the S&P 500, is a, in my view, viable strategy. I'm not saying you must you know, just go out and do it now. Uh, it is a viable strategy, but there are actually even better strategies. Okay, I'll give you another example. So this is another company that I've been looking at recently. It's an American company called Church & Dwight. Uh, what they do is they make baking soda but they, have, they make more than just baking soda now. They have a brand called OxyClean. They have a brand called Waterpik. Some of these brands you may not be familiar with, but Americans will know them quite well. Uh, now, if you had invested in this stock in 1991, uh, it was only $2. Today, it's about $90. So it's gone up uh, by 45 times in 30 years. Okay, so it, Which means that it's doubled every maybe five to seven years. Now, remember, uh, we're talking about the power compounding and we did our exercise, right? Let's say this stock has gone up by 45 times. For it to become a 100 bagger, that means go up by 100 times. Huh? Do you know that it only has to double one more time? That's all, you know? So if it, has, if it can double every five to seven years, which means that in the next five to seven years, huh, this stock, looking back to 1991, will be going up huh, not just 45 times, Will be going up 90 times because double ma right is you want one more time is 45 times two is 90 so it's almost a hundred bagger and it's only you just have to wait for another five to seven years and you have got a hundred bagger stock okay this so this is a, this is why you know one to two two to four four to six i uh, four to eight eight to sixteen and then so on and so forth so each double actually doubles the 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 doubling of your return and this is why investing in a good company can really work in your favor. Okay, so this is this is Church and Dwight. Uh, it's gone up by 45 times. I'll give you a few more examples. Uh, oh, sorry. This company, right, you may, it's because it's a very uh, boring company. It just sells baking soda and, and don't know what. So very, very simple, very boring. And you would have thought that there's such a company, 
would be uh, would not perform as well as like a Google or Facebook, right? Now, it is very hard uh, if you are standing here today to pick the Google, the future Google and Facebook, because for every Google and Facebook that succeed, uh, there's been a lot of other, um, say Yahoo was a search engine. It was very successful for one time. It's, nobody uses Yahoo anymore. Who else was there? Uh, Netscape, la, you know, so many uh, high-flying technology companies that have all fallen by the wayside. Now, if you can't pick the Google and the Facebook, now if you had invested in the S&P, and the S&P 500 has been largely made up of what we call the FANG stocks, which is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, and these stocks uh, today account for maybe 20 to 30% of the S&P 500. Now, even in the last 10 years, uh, with all these high-tech, high-growth companies being a large part of the S&P, uh, Church and Dwight was still able to outperform. Okay? So this is the power of um, investing in a, a good company that knows what it's doing and has a great business model. So, uh, also over the last uh, 10 years, uh, as the Church and Dwight has also outperformed uh, the S&P 500. So, so previously, the previous chart was over the last 30 years. So this is Church and Dwight. Okay, let me give you another example. Again, this is an American company. Uh, it's called O'Reilly Auto Parts. If you look at this company, it's done even better than Church and Dwight. I've deliberately chosen these companies uh, because they are very simple to understand. Like I said, Church and Dwight, what do they do? They just sell baking soda and a lot of other consumer staples. Uh, O'Reilly Auto Parts, what do they do? Very simple. They just sell auto parts. You know, the name tells you what they do. And this company, uh, if you... So I go back to 1998, okay, when I was starting work. Uh, it was trading at about 650. If I had invested $10,000 and stopped uh, and do nothing after that, uh, by today that same $10,000 will have become almost a million dollars over the last 23 years. And this is a real example because I've, I had saved up more than $10,000 by then when I started working you know, all the unpowered money and don't know what. Uh, so I ne definitely remember I had more than $10,000. But it would have, honestly, it would, I'm not sure it would be wise to put $10,000 into one single company. Uh, but... You know, it's possible, okay? <clears throat> now, but this is not very practical, okay? Uh, it's not practical for, for me to tell you, hey, it's, it's also probably not easy to find the next O'Reilly. Now, O'Reilly, I don't know whether you will go, where you will go from here, um, but I'm just, you know, because I'm, this is about going back in time. Uh, so if I go back in time, uh, this company over the last 23 years has gone up by 86 times. Now, let me uh, give you some... Uh, uh, more realistic numbers that you can do uh, starting from today, okay, using this as an example. So, some of you maybe have just started work and you may not have saved any money yet, okay, maybe you will never save your angpao money, you're just spending, spending every time. Um, so, I, give a, I did a hypothetical um, analysis and I went to download uh, prices for the Straits Times Index the S&P 500 and Berkshire Hathaway. You guys know Berkshire Hathaway, right? Berkshire Hathaway is a company run by Warren Buffett. You could invest in it. It's been around for a long, long time. So back in July 1998, which is when I started my first job, the STI was about 1,000 points. S&P 500, 1,001. And Berkshire Hathaway, every share was trading at $6.84. Fast forward to April, because now May is not ended now. Huh? So I, I do a monthly monthly closing price. The closing price in April was uh, for the STI, 3,200, S&P 500, 4,001, and Berkshire Hathaway was 200 and call it $75. So I've also calculated how many times it's gone up <clears throat> in price. But what I assume is, which was actually my, round, my, my rough salary back in 19, July 1998. I was earning about $3,500 a month. I don't know what is the starting salary for graduates these days. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's around $5,000. Is that, is that fair? I, I don't know. I, I'm really not sure. Thereabouts, huh? Okay, so I assume that you start at about $3,500. So $3,500 in today's money is reasonable, right? For, for a fresh grad or for anybody. 
uh, chosen father, and I assume no bonus. I know that in Singapore, you typically get at least one month bonus. So I'm assuming no bonus to be conservative. So you could say that maybe that bonus, you can go and enjoy yourself. Uh, and I assume that you save 20% of your salary and fully invested this 20% uh, in one of these three. Okay, whether it's the STI, S&P 500, or uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And I also assume that you get a salary increment of 5% every year. Uh, I was asking some of my friends, uh, is it reasonable to assume 5%? Uh, I think it is about right, uh, you know, maybe four, maybe six. You know, some people, you're a high performer, you can get promoted and you can get better than 5% increment. But I think 5%, I suspect it's about right because if I project the 5% per year uh, to today, okay, now, my peers, uh, if they had, for example, if they had joined the army, uh, signed on as a full-time full um, SAF, uh, uh, by now, they will be maybe just normal, lah, huh? Lieutenant Colonel, about the kind of rank, I think. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, the high flyers, maybe BG or full Colonel. Uh, you hentataki, maybe you major. Lah. <laughs> my, I'm talking about my peers. Then I went to check the SEF website, uh, what, what a Lieutenant Colonel in Singapore earns. And uh, I, I don't know where I look, lah, but they said between nine to 12,000, which I think is about right. So, so basically, I use that as a sanity check whether 5% is uh, roughly correct or not. And I, my conclusion is, yeah, I think it's about right. Because if I if I increase my salary of 2,500 per month uh, at 5% over the last 23 years, I end up at uh, $10,000 per month, okay? So this is, as that means I'll be earning, if I was still in Singapore and earning a normal career progression kind of salary, I will be earning about $10,200 today, okay? So based on this, and I'll be saving about $2,000 a month and invest into each one of these three. So by doing that, uh, I would have invested a total of 343000 and the result of investing each of these, because they perform differently, right? If all the money had gone into the Straits Times Index, uh, I would have about 428000 So, actually very disappointing, like, if you ask me. You know, invested 343000 and only got $430,000 back. If I had invested in the S&P 500, not bad, okay? I tripled my money. Invested 343000 now it's worth 900000 if I invested in Berkshire Hathaway, again, similarly trend 43, but I get about $1 million. So this is what I would have gotten uh, by investing in each of these things. Now, um, I'm assuming that I don't receive any dividends. So that's, a, now Berkshire Hathaway does not give dividends, but the S&P 500 and the Straits Times Index does, okay? Because they, their component stocks do give a little bit of dividend. But to keep the study simple, um, this is roughly the result you get, okay? So when I think about it, mm, not very interesting. So if I were to go back in time uh, and talk to myself 23 years ago, I would encourage the young Joshua uh, actually not to invest in any of these fellas, okay? Not to invest in the index. Now, I'm not saying it's not viable. It is a viable investment strategy, okay? You can uh, invest it and it's not bad, okay? The result really is not bad. But what I'm trying to, and you, it's also very easy, you know, to think about it, you have to just, just, just invest in the index. Now, what I would encourage myself is, which is what I said earlier, is to find a great company and hold on tight. I was reading a book recently. Uh, you guys know about a company called Walmart. It's an American uh, retail company, Walmart. It's a big company and it's done extremely well in the stock market. But I tell you, the, there is not a single investor or shareholder uh, who has been able to buy Walmart from day one and hold on to today. The only people who were able to buy Walmart and hold to today uh, is only one group of people, the founders. So uh, Mr. Walmart himself and his children. They are the only ones uh, that really benefited from the full ride. Okay, A lot of investors discovered, wow, Walmart is a great company. So they had bought into the company, but none of them have been able to hold on the whole way through. It is not easy, I guarantee you, it's really not easy, okay? Uh, but it is possible, okay? It is possible. So I think that's something that I really tell myself, look, find a great company and hang on for dear life, right? And the, the result of that uh, is this. So remember our church and Dwight and uh, O'Reilly? So if we had done the same thing, okay? 
save the same amount of money, twenty uh, percent of our of our salary, and put it into this company. If you have put the money into Church and Dwight, and Church and Dwight, like I said, is not difficult to understand. Okay, the company is just selling baking soda. Um, your money, if you invested three hundred and forty-three, same uh, same same three hundred forty-three thousand dollars, which is the over the last twenty-three years, the twenty percent every month. That three hundred forty-three would have grown to two point two million dollars today, just from one stock in doing the twenty percent saving. So you don't need to be very smart. You don't need to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to go and uh, take high risk in starting a business or whatever. Uh, it would have grown. And I think with two point two million dollars in the bank today, I think can retire right. So you may not be able to live a lavish lifestyle, but at two point two million dollars, if you buy a any stock that gives you a uh, average say five percent yield or four percent yield because you know interest rates have gone down, you will get an income of eighty thousand dollars a year. You know, I think in Singapore, yes, you you won't have a lavish lifestyle, but I think it's quite okay. You know, you you you'll be quite um you'll be quite set for life. You don't have to work a single day of your life anymore. Uh, if you had done, if you had found an O'Reilly Auto Parts, uh, that same investment would have grown to. Four point six million dollars. So this is the power of compounding, and if these companies continue to be well run, uh, perhaps they'll just continue compounding. Okay, Church and Dwight, I didn't mention earlier, has been around for one hundred and fifty years. So it's gone through more than World War One and World War Two. It's gone through the Great Depression. It's gone through so many different things, and not only that, is throughout uh, it's paid dividends unbroken uh, for the last hundred and twenty years. Okay, that's church and right. So now again, I must say that I'm not. I'm just doing this for illustration. I'm not encouraging you. You know, after this, you hang up. You go and buy these companies. No, don't 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 do that. I'm just using this as an illustration that if I could go back in time, I would tell myself to look uh, for the wonderful companies that will continue to keep on doing very well uh, and earn money for its shareholders. Uh, and continue to grow into the future. All right. So that's that's what uh, this illustration is supposed to to provide. And uh, if I could sort of wrap up the part about investing, uh, I don't know who is the one who originated this saying. There's been this this quote has been attributed to quite a few people. I didn't come up with it, but it is this, which is to protect the downside, and the upside will take care of itself. Okay, so but if you want to invest in the stock market or real estate or whatever you want to invest, make sure you look at, consider all the risks that will present itself. Uh, as long as the risk can be taken care of, you'll be all right. Okay, so protect the downside first and don't worry about the upside. The upside will take care of itself, okay? Um, this is something that I've been learning quite a bit in, uh, in recent times, uh, which is to spend more time thinking, not doing, all right? Don't, don't it's, it's very, especially in a place like Singapore, right, where we are very, um, you know, we are always on the go, we are always trying to achieve and do this and do that, very rush, you know, it's a very rushing kind of lifestyle. I really would encourage you, uh, take this seriously, uh, spend more time thinking, and what I try to do is I, especially recently, I've been trying to wake up earlier uh, before the kids are awake. So we'll talk about 5, 5.30. Just wake up earlier, you know, uh, do your quiet time. Um, and I found that for me personally, it's not, uh, I get the most benefit huh, from the time that is after the reading by the Bible part, whereby, you know, I just, quieten myself, I turn off all the lights and it's still dark, right? I turn off all the light and I just meditate and then just um, just open my heart and ask Holy Spirit, you know, what do they tell me? Sometimes it's spiritual stuff. Um, like yesterday, it was about love. Um, today was different. Uh, and sometimes it's about, it's about business stuff. You know, I literally get like business ideas or even investment ideas. Like so recently, I've been thinking, oh, you know, I bought a piece of property in, in where I live uh, nearby uh, recently. I was like, oh, what should I do? How should I fund it? Um, and I just felt a lot telling me. Now, sometimes it may be just me thinking to myself, possibly, but God does say that he put his spirit in, uh, in us. So often what we think is our, our self telling us could be the spirit of God telling us as well. Okay, So I really would like to encourage you uh, to spend more time thinking 
uh, about things uh, and, and not so much about doing. Okay, and in line with that, um, read at least one book a week. Uh, I try to do that. I've been doing this for four or five years now. So one book a week will be 52 a year. So for the last few years, I've been able to reach between 65 to 75 books a year. Uh, I, I, do, I do that uh, a lot through, re, um, what I call it, Audible, uh, through audio books. And as Singaporeans, you know, you can go to the National Library, you can download all the audio books and it's free, right? So I, I do that. Um, obviously, just listening to the book or, you know, skimming it through, you won't get as much benefit as really reading it and slowly, uh, but still better than nothing, okay? What I'm trying to do is get breath, uh, get a, a big a sense of like, you know, a, a, a wide range of topics, and there's books that I that really jump out at me. Uh, I will go and buy the, the Kindle version and, or, and, and really read and underline and almost study the book. Okay. Recently, one book that I've been sort of trying to study uh, is called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Hauser. It's a new book. I think he published it only last year. Uh, it's available in our National Library. I, I use our National Library a lot, even though I'm, I'm here in Tauranga, in New Zealand. So I think it's one of the best resources. And then that's, our National Library really has a lot of books, okay? It's like you, you, um, yeah, you, 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 it's, you cannot finish, uh, huh? You say. So, so big use of it, big use of it. I'm very proud of our National Library. So read at least one book a week. And, um, oh, this is something that, you know, when I was young, you know, my, my parents uh, would have told me about this. Our friends are very important. I basically, one year in, one year out, okay, didn't, but, you know, after, now that I'm in my almost 50 years old, I really see uh, the, the wisdom of this. You know, you're you are still young. Uh, I really would encourage you to treasure the friendship, you know, treasure the, the, the cell group that you have. Uh, don't, uh, don't take each other for granted. Uh, really spend time to develop the friendship, whether it's within your cell group or your friends from primary school, secondary school, uh, JC or whatever. Um, you know, this, this, these friends, um, are, they are the important, okay? That's, that's something that I've, I've come to really uh, treasure and appreciate because, you know, as you grow older, uh, it's, it's really very hard to make genuine friends. Uh, and as you grow older, Unfortunately, you know, there'll be people who move away or pass away or there'll be circumstances that, that come about that such that you will not be, you have less and less, what we say, true friends. Uh, so, so really treasure them, okay? Uh, spend time uh, building their friendship. You, you will notice there's a, almost a theme uh, in, in, in some of the things I've been sharing, which are not very money related like for example i talk about find a mentor you know find it's more important to find the right boss than to uh find the highest pay it's about relationship friends again is about relationship spend time thinking and meditating on the word of god it's about relationship we've got lah. Huh? so so that, that that the theme about relationship is something that has um really come to the fore for me in fact go back in time uh, i would tell a younger me to spend more time on those things because they really are, are very important, okay? Uh, this is the, my last point. Uh, I think this is a quote from Billy Graham. I didn't know it was Billy Graham. I've heard this. I've heard uh, people quote this before. I didn't know that it came from Billy Graham, but he said this, okay, I'll read it out to you. Uh, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. And when character is lost, everything is lost. So we've been talking about how to make money. We've been talking about friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know how Solomon ended, right? So I have to end with this. Uh, not with everything is meaningless, but uh, integrity is everything. Okay. As you, as you start in your career, uh, whatever you're doing, you know, make sure that uh, integrity is number one. You know, don't ever sell out on your character or your integrity. Um, so... Yeah, that, that's something that is um, that is very important in whatever you do. Okay, so that's my uh, short sharing. I don't have any more slides to go. And yeah, I hope you guys have en en enjoyed. I enjoyed that. I hope that you guys uh, have learned something. And 
uh, feel free to ask me questions, you know, whatever questions you might have, uh, type it in the chat box, or you can ask me over the microphone, or you can ask via Mark, or whatever works for you. Yep. Thank, thank you, Joshua. Thank you so much for sharing. Wow, I think we have a feast of, uh, of uh, learning from your life. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> from your point. So thank you so much for being so open to share mm. about not just faith, but also investing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for everyone, yeah, if you are ready with a question or you have something in mind, just feel free to ask anything in the chat or if you want to turn on your microphone, please by all means as well. Uh, maybe, maybe as we wait for everyone to come up with their questions, mm. yeah, uh, maybe I can ask Joshua. Sure, sure, sure. Spot Go for it, Mark. For <laughs> one question first. Do you but know, you can I, I don't know about you. Mm. So I was going to say, by the way, you, yeah. you guys can ask me anything, okay? I, I, there's no, uh, there's no nothing out of bounds. So you can ask me anything. I do not, I will not know the answer to everything, obviously, uh, but you can ask me anything, okay? And if you are watching Facebook Live, you can type in the comments. I can, I might have time to look at it as well and I can, I can uh, respond to that. Okay, go for it, Mark. Yeah. So uh, I don't know about the, about everyone, uh, but I noticed that, you know, when, uh, Joshua shared a lot about uh, investment. Can you hear his passion? Wow, it's really uh, very uh, powerful. Yeah, and, and I can I can really feel it and sense it. Yeah, and I think maybe one question I'd like to pose and uh, put Joshua on the spot is, you know, now that you've come uh, this journey uh, mm. to where you are right now with, with a lot of wealth mm. and the resources that's, that God has blessed you with, uh, how do you, how, how do you use these resources wisely? Yeah. Mm. And also, uh, how do you balance that and make sure you don't fall into the pitfall of mm. you know, uh, going to the ego, ego traps like you have mentioned and mm. how do you guard your heart as well? Very good. Share a bit about that. Very good question. Uh, I, I learned this from, who is this? I can't remember his name now. Uh, Craig Hugh. Uh, he has this concept called Closing the circle. I tell you, uh, actually, uh, it's actually more difficult uh, and more important for people who have money uh, to really guard their heart. People who, if you are just starting out and you don't have that as a problem yet, so-called problem yet, uh, actually, it's not a big problem. But I see a lot of um, rich people or people with wealth, right? They are the ones uh, that really need to budget. Now, when you don't have money, you definitely need to budget because you cannot spend, if you're earning $3,000 a month, you cannot be spending $6,000 a month. Again, you will go broke sooner or later. But it's the people who are rich, right, uh, that really, really need to budget because they have no constraints. They have so much money that they do not need to budget anymore. It's because, precisely because of that, they need to budget because, let's say... Um, give you some some numbers um let's say i i my 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 passive income is uh, say a million dollars a year for example okay now if i receive a million dollars a year honestly uh it is actually very difficult to spend a million dollars a year really you no know, it's very difficult i mean how much you want to eat how much you want to um spend and you can buy yes you can buy a gcb you can buy a really big house uh on, on and whatnot but at the end of the day, a house is a house, right? You have, you need one bed, you need one car, you need maybe two pairs or three pairs of shoes, no matter. But it's very, very hard to spend a million dollars. Um, so for people who are wealthy, you do need to what I call close your circle. And because once you've closed your circle, right? Uh, and you don't, uh, how do you call it? You don't anyhow expand your, expand your, how you spend your money so that when God brings the increase, uh, so let's say you are, let's say you earn hundred thousand dollars a year. Suddenly, you receive an extra hundred or two hundred thousand as a bonus. But because you are spending within the hundred thousand, when the extra one hundred, extra two hundred thousand comes in, and you have already closed your circle, you know, whatever your expenses you have, you know you have really provided for it. You can then uh, come before God and say, okay, there's this extra money. Um, now, how should I spend it? You know, you, you are in a position where you can ask a lot. If you don't do that, right? If you're just, if you don't keep track of your expenses, if you haven't closed your circle, then whatever money comes in, it just goes out right away. You will never build that surplus and you will never be able to uh, prayerfully ask, uh, how should we be spending our money? 
So close the circle. I think that's the that's how how I would I would do it. Now to be to be very frank with you, I went through a period of time in my life where I didn't close the circle. You know, so because no need to budget, ma. You know, so so I I I would just you know spend 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 spend. Eh, eh, got a lot of money, but how come like no savings? <laughs> you know, almost. Um, yeah, so I, I, I realized that even for, there's something that I've learned that uh, even people who are fi- so-called financially free doesn't mean that you no longer need a budget. In fact, sometimes you are the guy that needs it the most. <laughs> hmm. Thank you so much, Joshua. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think we have some questions. Okay, question asks, um, as someone who is totally new to investment, no, fi- no background, what are your tips? Uh, what are your tips for them as to where to start? Uh, what are the things you should go read up on or research on? Maybe what I can do is uh, come up with a book list, some, some books that you can, uh, you can read. Uh, there are really a lot. You just go to the National Library and keyword search invest. So many. Start with the Warren Buffett ones. Okay, those are quite easy to read. There are quite a lot of books written about Warren Buffett and how he invests. Uh, That's a very good way to start. Um, And then take it from there. You know, know, when I talk about compounding uh, uh, in terms of money, right? But knowledge can also compound. So as you read, you when you first read your first investment book, you might ah, wow, it's so difficult to understand. I've got I don't know how to do. I'm not a finance trained. I'm not accounting trained. It's very it's very hard to understand. But knowledge will compile. You read one book, the second book, the third book, the fourth book. Uh, before you know it, you will have read many many books, and that knowledge will build on each one, and you begin to read. Oh, now I know what the guy was talking about. Oh, five years ago I read the book. Now I understand what the guy is talking about. So that's that's how you do it. Uh, now, obviously, on my website, I, I do write a short blog uh, from time to time. You can you can you can go there and uh, you can also go there to see some of the some of the high level things I talk about. Uh, you can join my Facebook group. You can I write some short articles about how to invest. Uh, some very high level stuff, lah. Mm. I hope that's helpful, uh, Vishun. Okay, so uh, yeah, feel free to keep the questions coming. Yeah, I'm just looking at yeah. Can come free. Uh, uh, keep the questions coming. I'm just looking at my at the Facebook live. See whether there are any questions there or not. But uh, uh, continue asking me, Mark. Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, well for me. Uh, being a father, I think mm. one of the challenges I faced in the marketplace was balancing work and family. So I'm sure mm. that you know, with your uh, very interesting career pathway, how do you juggle <laughs> your job as you know a, a banker and and your family? You know, and spend time, More easy, time with yeah. children and not easy. Yeah. I, I, what, until what, today, what was your journey like? Yeah, until today, you know, when I was uh, when I was a young uh, analyst. Um, I still remember going to, I, I did a lot of work in, in Indonesia and the Philippines. So I would go, I would fly out every Monday, come back every Friday, you know, for, for, quite, a, for quite a period of time, almost a year, I think. Uh, but it was quite fun. Um, like until today, I'm still uh, learning. In, in fact, just a few days ago, you know, I, I, I was in, in, the, in the meditation time again, you know, I just felt a lot reminding me that at the end of the day, right, uh, I have a few desires in my heart. You know, one of them is to really have that walk close up with God. Uh, secondly, to really have that uh, close relationship with my family, you know, my wife, my kids. Because, you know, my kids are still very young, uh, 12, 10, and 8. Uh, before you know it, they're going to be teenagers. Before you know it, they'll be 25 years old. And you almost lose them. So I, 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 I'm almost afraid of that, you know. So I, I just... Constantly, I have to remind myself, you know, uh, to try and spend some spend as much time as I can with, with them. But I also read recently somewhere uh, a very interesting point. Okay, your children uh, actually do not need, neither do they want you to be there all the time. What they really want uh, is uh, perhaps for you to spend there maybe half an hour or one hour of really quality time with them, and often is enough. Because after that, uh, they, you know, you play with them for half an hour, one hour. Uh, depends on age. Uh, huh? uh, the babies, maybe you need to spend a lot of time. But once they get older and older, they actually naturally actually need to spend time on their own thing. So it's not that difficult. 
yeah. But it's important. Thanks. So you do you just have to make time for it. Yeah. Mm. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got some questions here from, from the Facebook Live. Uh, Caleb says, uh, Caleb says, oh, okay, after listening to you for 15 years, I still have so much to learn from you. <laughs> okay. Uh, he also asked, okay, I guess he's asking, you know, whether there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. For example, housing loan versus car loan. Uh, are they the same kind of debt? I, yes, I do. I do differentiate between what I call good debt and bad debt. Uh, I do have some, some debt, not a lot. Um, I try to keep my loan to value ratio below 50%. My house is fully paid for, so I don't have any loans on that. My, for my investment property, I try to uh, borrow less than 50%. So let's say that if the property is worth a million dollars, I try not to let, uh, borrow more than 500,000, even though uh, I'm allowed to go to 600 or 700,000. I don't know what's the rule for Singapore these days. Uh, but I try to try to do that. And I've uh, even and in the companies that I invest, right? Mark, you will know the companies that I, that I choose uh, tend to be companies uh, that got zero debt. I, I love companies that are able to, and is that probably a hallmark of quality? Because companies that are able to make a lot of money and yet have zero debt uh, tells me that hey, their business model is really powerful. They do not need to borrow money from outside, outside outsiders or borrow from the bank or from shareholders uh, uh, and they can keep growing just on the cash flow that is producing. Okay? So there are, there, are, there are not many companies that are like that, but they can be found. Okay? They, they are, and they tend to be very uh, high quality as well. Uh, I would like to bring up something about the car loan as well. You know, remember just now I was talking about the supper I had with my mentor. I was a banker by then. I was earning pretty good money. And uh, I remember bonuses would be like one year is like quite normal. Um, the, so the, I, I could have bought a car, okay? Uh, I, I, but because of that, you know, when you're young, right? It's very tempting, you know, you, you start to earn money, you want to go and buy a car. And you know, in Singapore, it's very expensive, right? So back then I could afford to, I definitely could afford to, you know, for the down payment for a car and to buy a car. Uh, but after that chat, I resisted that. <laughs> I resisted the notion. Uh, I didn't buy a car until I could pay in full for the car. And even back when I was in Singapore, and here I've never borrowed money to buy a car because cars, in my view, uh, is not an asset. It's a depreciate. It's a depreciating. I don't like to use the word asset for a car. Uh, it's just an expense. Okay. So I like to buy nice cars, uh, but. And that's my only indulgence, uh, but I, I, I won't borrow money for to buy a car. Okay, that's my personal stand uh, because a car does not generate income. Um, and I don't like to buy new. Uh, I've only bought a brand new car once. Uh, this would be around the same time, you know, just like I mentioned about how, you know, I go crazy, you know, I didn't have the budget, blah, blah, blah. I went to buy a brand new Lexus, I remember, uh, Lexus GS. Uh, I Thank God I still paid cash. Like I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't borrow money for it. Uh, but that was the only time I ever bought a brand new car. I ever, uh, ever since that, then, I, I've, never, I've never bought a brand new car again. <laughs> Learned my lesson. Wow, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, that's really uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, I always thought that you had, yeah, uh, you always bought, uh, I mean, uh, new cars, but I didn't realize, oh, only one oh. time. Only one time in Singapore, wow. <laughs> Alexis. I still remember wow. Alexis GS. Okay. Well, I thought you lost so much money. I had it for only, I had it for only one year. Uh, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> it was so hard right. to sell. Wow. Okay. Uh, Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So, 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 okay. so my interesting another interesting story about car is that when I bought my first car uh, in Singapore, I actually made money. Okay, in Singapore. How I did it was oh. that, yes, uh, Singapore cars are very expensive, right? Because I mean, I need to, just some of my friends, a lot, a lot of friends in New Zealand and around the world now, they, they, they don't know how much cars cost in Singapore. Uh, I, my very first car was an Alfa Romeo 156, uh, and a red one, very sporty looking, very sleek. Uh, but I got it as a repossessed car. So it was auctioned, it was for auction. Uh, so I got it really cheap. And because it's the Alfa Romeo, I think a lot of people didn't dare to, to bid for it. So I managed to get it uh, at a good price, drove it for two years. I was so scared, you know, Alfa Romeo is not the most reliable car on the planet. Uh, I drove it for two years and sold it. And I think I made, I, I don't know, one, $2,000 out of it after driving for two years. 
that was a very interesting uh and that was my first car wow uh wow i think it's really rare i mean just for the friends who are overseas i think in singapore it's just almost impossible to it's impossible <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how i did <laughs> yeah, it i, I remember wow this yeah. those these were the days i tell you this would have been in the early 2000s maybe uh where you will still go to the classified ads, you know, in the trace times, the 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 like the, the classified ads were like a literally a separate <laughs> paper by itself. So I would go into the car section. I found somehow I found this and then uh, uh went to bid for it. I still remember got the fax. You write your write the write down the price that you want to pay for it and fax it to the finance company. I see. Yeah, so that was yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, some more time maybe for a few more questions if you have a question you know uh, please do ask yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah we we i think joshua is more than happy to share on anything yeah mm. or any questions okay i'm just looking at you just type uh, into the chat or yeah type yeah. to the chat or whatever how okay okay there's another question here uh two other questions here uh, from Ruth, how do we settle the housing loan fast? Okay, um, I may or may not be the best person to answer this. Uh, so there's, there's someone who asked on Facebook Live, uh, asked what is the best way to settle the housing loan fast? I, I say I'm not the best, but because I recently came across a young couple that did it, okay? And they did it, I tell you, I'm so impressed with, with this young couple. Uh, they What they did was, so dual income, right? Uh, husband and wife. And they, they really, really go hard at it, okay? What they do is dual income, but they live on one income. So let's say, for example, uh, let's say husband earns 50K, wife earns 50K, for example. Uh, the amount that the wife earns is saved, is not spent. And what they'll do is they just spend whatever the husband earns. So essentially, they're saving 50% of their income, like, huh? And then they will, uh, actually the interview is on my Facebook Live. You should go and read, you should, you should definitely go and watch it. It's worth your time, okay? It's an hour or so, but it's definitely worth your time how they did it. Uh, and they just uh, used that 50K to, to, to pay off their, their housing loan. So they save very hard. They, they definitely uh, sacrifice a lot. But uh, one thing I do remember them doing is that they would uh, seed whatever they feel the Lord telling them. So let, let's say throughout this time, they'll continue to give uh, where they feel the Lord telling them to give, right? So if they feel that, oh, uh, the Lord is asking them to sow into this particular thing, they will sow into it, you know? And then they'll look up verses that uh, with a promise attached to that particular seed and that promise uh, and, and pray over it. So it's a, it, it was, I, I was so encouraged and so inspired by, by what they shared. Uh, you, you should go to my Facebook page and watch that, watch that interview. Uh, so that's that's the question about um, how to settle the housing loan fast. Okay, come back to your question here, uh, Hui Shun. Uh, is there a reason why you are into property investments uh, in Singapore context? Do you think that will be one of the good areas for investment? Uh, unfortunately, my view of Singapore real estate is that Singapore real estate is really not cheap. Uh, it is very expensive. It's very high ticket. You like you just to do the down payment, right? If you're buying one of those Mickey Mouse apartments, which are uh, really small, uh, it's, it's very difficult. It's, it will still cost you almost a million dollars just to buy that small little uh, studio apartment. Um, so I'm not sure that real estate is a very viable strategy. When I was young, I remember people telling me, "Oh, Singapore is an island. No, cannot already. You know, that's it." But I realized they can, can go up to the, in the sky, can go to 50 stories. So not technically unlimited in that sense. So, um, and it's very hard to add value. Like an apartment is an apartment. This is very hard in Singapore to add value. Whereas in other countries, like say Australia, New Zealand, the USA, you can add value because let's say you buy a house, uh, let's say a two bedroom house, you could knock down a wall, you could build a wall and suddenly it becomes a three bedroom. So typically two bedroom houses, let's say cost, the valuation is 300,000. You add one more bedroom, suddenly it becomes 400,000. And you don't have to spend 100,000 to do that. So there are more opportunities to add value uh, in places uh, like this. Whereas in Singapore, it's much harder. Not impossible, but I find it is harder. And you will read a lot of stories. Uh, this is something that I hope Singaporeans will, will really pay attention to. 
you read a lot of stories uh, in the newspaper, uh, Business Times, Straits Times, The Edge, uh, they like to highlight, oh, this house bought, the guy sold and made a million dollars. They forgot to mention, uh, this guy made a million dollars uh, over 20 years. So he paid, let's say he paid a million dollars 20 years ago, and today it's worth $2 million, and therefore they say that he made a million dollars. If you ask me, uh, that is a totally, <laughs> I don't know how to say, it's a lousy return. It deserves to be... I, I don't know what's the word for it because over 20 years, if you can only double over 20 years, uh, it is embarrassing, you know? It is very disastrous to have that kind of result. You, you, cannot, get, you cannot get financially independent doing something like that. So, um, and I, I realized that the, the rate of growth for, uh, for real estate in Singapore has been not great. Uh, I do not know the future. Maybe it will pick up again. I'm not sure. Uh, so, I'm not very keen to, to invest uh, in real estate in a big way uh, in, in, in Singapore. Now, having said that, right, I believe in buying your house. You know, um, if you are in Singapore, you definitely should try and buy your home. Uh, I, I don't like to rent. Uh, I, like to, I like to own my house. Uh, and, you know, then I don't have to worry that uh, the tenant, the landlord will kick me out or, or anything like that. So, the the I will encourage every one of you, if you can, you know, at least go and buy HDB because that is a that is a, a heavily subsidized by the government. So that would be one thing that you, I would definitely encourage you to do. But uh, I, in my, that's my personal opinion. I wouldn't be very keen on uh, investing in real estate uh, in Singapore. Unfortunately, I know that this will probably be something that. Um, a lot of Singaporeans uh, don't like to hear <laughs> because we all like to buy real estate, right? But now that I've lived here, uh, I've seen both sides of the coin. Um, yeah, this is one of the things I would tell myself. If I could go back in time, uh, uh, don't bother investing in real estate. Just buy, okay, can uh, you, but you must, you really must buy at the right time. Uh, there are, but again, there are easier ways to do it, you know? For example, find the next church and Dwight or find the next O'Reilly, okay? So that's, that's what I would tell myself if I could go back in time. Uh, Joel, you asked a very good question. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but let me get to one question that's on here, which is, uh, Clarin asks, did you plan your retirement or it so happened, what is your definition of uh, retirement? Okay, I didn't plan my retirement. Uh, I, okay, I just be, I'm just being very honest here, okay? When I was younger, I just wanted to be rich. That, that, was my, that was my goal. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be financially independent. Um, uh, sounds sinful, right? <laughs> so that was my goal. That was, just, that, that was my, my um, that was what I was going after, okay? So I wasn't planning to retire, but I was definitely planning to get to a stage where I would be financially independent. Now, now that I'm older and hopefully a bit wiser, um, I try to stay away, for, stay away from the word financial independence, uh, especially the word independent, because when you are uh, independent, right, what do you really mean? Um, there's a danger that when you are independent, you, um, it carries a connotation that uh, you are also independent from having to depend on God. You know? So that becomes something that you go to the other extreme and you're just depending on yourself. Uh, so I, I don't quite like to use the word uh, independent anymore. But back then, I definitely was very driven by that. And as I uh, get to the stage where I, had, I realized that, oh, I don't need to work for the rest of my life because when I calculate how much money I need to spend and I calculate how much passive income I have, um, the income of exceed the expense, sweet, you know? That's it. You know, that's that's my that would be my definition of retirement, whereby uh, I, I read really reach the stage where my passive income exceeds my uh, expenses, and I, I don't need to work for someone else ever again. And I have not had a boss for many many years now, so it's essentially been just full time investing. That's what I do most of the time, and I love it. Like you know, every day I'm looking for. What really gets me excited, you know, Mark, you will know, right? When I find a I find a new company, so, wow, this company is so good. Like, where how come I've never looked at it so 
look at it deeply before. Uh, that, that's something that I really get excited about. Uh, I also quite I also get quite excited when I find uh, real estate opportunities, especially here. There's some there, there really are more opportunities here. I'm not encouraging you to come here and do it, okay? But I'm just since you've seen people asking, uh, like finding the the thing, finding the I don't know. It's, to me, it's like a treasure hunt. It's like a game. Like, I, I love it. Like, wow, how come it's there and no one else has seen it? You know, it's, it's there. So I, I, I get a kick out of that. So that's what I love doing. Uh, and so, so when I deep retire, although I, I define retirement as I'm not having to work for money, but at the same time, it doesn't mean I stop doing everything. Uh, I still do what I love, which is to look for investment opportunities. Okay. Okay, so that was uh, Clarence's question. Now I'll come back to uh, the Joel. Okay, Joel asks, um, which electric vehicle companies uh, do you rec recommend to invest in? Actually, in one of my slides earlier, I, I think I forgot to mention it. it was written on the slide, but I didn't talk about it, which is these two things, okay? Number one, don't trade. Number two, don't chase the latest fad. Okay, uh, don't trade, meaning don't try and get in and out of stocks or real estate or whatever you want to do. Uh, you can make a lot of money. And I was a full-time trader for a while. Uh, I sort of loved it, but uh, I realized that it was choking my heart. And you know, in out, in out, in out, in out. Yes, I made a lot of money, but very stressful. So I, I, I don't do it anymore. The other thing is um, the electric vehicles. Right? Whether it's an electric vehicle or... Uh, cyber security or whatever is the latest fad. I can, uh, I, I talk about this a little bit just now. It's very easy to, or rather, um, okay, Warren Buffett shared his story recently. He, he said that back in the, was it early 1900s, everybody could see uh, that cars would be the next big thing. It was the latest invention. It was the hottest, uh, hottest thing then, okay, to invest in a car manufacturer. There were, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of car manufacturing companies. And he bought into one of them. And this company uh, uh, had made the, some car that won some race like, in the United States. So, so it's a technologically, for, the, for that time, uh, advanced car. Uh, so they had very good engine and everything. But the company went bankrupt. Okay? And in the United States today, uh, there are only three. GM, Ford, and who are so the, who is the the basically three main manufacturers lah. Everybody died or consolidated into one of these three. So it is it's very hard. Uh, the what I'm trying to say is that electric vehicles, I believe, will take over. Okay, I don't have one yet, but I believe that my next car highly likely to be some kind of electric vehicle. So as a technology, it is definitely the way. Now, where the, but who will be the winner in that technology? Uh, I do not know. Not only that, because everybody knows that that is the next big thing, right? All the EV companies are very expensive because everybody is rushing into it and trying to sort of buy a stake in them. All of, of all of them, uh, not all of them will succeed. Um, I don't want to slam Tesla, but I really, I respect Elon Musk, but I don't like a lot of the things that he does. Okay, so um, the you do, you just do not know. Okay, that BMW will come out with an EV, Toyota will come out with an EV. You know, everybody will come out with an EV. So it's very hard to pick who will be the uh, uh, the winner. And even if they can pick the winner, because of the valuation that they are trading at right now, uh, even if you buy right and it turns out to be the winner, you may or may not make very good returns out of it. Okay, so that's my long-winded answer to, to EVs. I uh, hope I answered your question, Joel. Uh, Michael asks, uh, what is then your philosophy about lending? Uh, if properties in Singapore are unwise, especially for heavily leveraged investments, uh, example of this income investments. Um, okay, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but... I, I guess uh, you're asking me about debt in general. So I do, uh, someone else asked a different question earlier about um, good debt versus bad debt. So if you borrow money to spend, meaning to spend on like lifestyle or to spend on um, just normal expenditure, uh, I would not encourage that 
for example, you no know, spending on your credit card if you don't have the money. Uh, I've never had credit card in my debt, debt in my life. I use credit cards just to you know for convenience. I always pay them off. Uh, almost the next day, actually, I just use internet banking and transfer the money, and that's it. Um, for the other uh, other good debt would be if I borrow money, for example, uh, to invest in uh, real estate. Okay, which is to generate income. So it's an investment um, to, but even when I do that, I try not to uh, have too much. So I will not, I will not go for highly leveraged in, uh, investments. Uh, that's when it's, it's very easy to fail. Uh, you guys are familiar with Warren Buffett, right? And you've heard of his, you know, he has a very good partner called Charlie Munger. So the, these two are, a lot of people are familiar with them. A lot of people are not aware there was actually a third guy. His name is Rick. Gurin or something like that. This number three guy uh, was together with Warren Buffett and Charlie Bunker. Unfortunately, I think in the 70s, he had to sell all his shares in Berkshire Hathaway to Warren Buffett during the recession. Why? He was heavily leveraged. He had borrowed a lot of money to buy stocks. And for a while, he was doing very well because the stocks kept going up. But it got to the stage where because the market turned and he couldn't meet the margin call, uh, he had to sell everything cheap to Warren Buffett. So, and he was a very smart guy, you know, he was with Warren Buffett, he was with Charlie Munger, they were picking the same, you know, good companies. The only difference was that he borrowed heavily to invest rather than Charlie, uh, like unlike Charlie and Warren Buffett, where they were just uh, investing steadily. And you know how, how rich they have become. Oh, by the way, talking about Warren Buffett, uh, um, I read another article recently, he, at the age of 50, he was worth only about, I say only, yeah. so this is many years ago, right? He was, his net worth was less than a billion dollars, maybe 450 or something like that. Today, he's 94 or 95 billion, something like that. So from 400 something uh, to now 90 something is the power of compounding again. You know, it keeps doubling, 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 doubling every number of years. So that's the power of compounding. Just, Invest for the long term. Lah. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Um, okay. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh yeah, uh it's about almost close to 4 30. Yeah. Uh are there any last questions? And mm. uh anyone, yeah, I'd like to have one last question to ask. Mm. I have one last question which is quite popular that people always like to ask me and I've uh, answered before. Uh, this guy just asked me on Facebook Live which is, uh, what is your view on investing in cryptocurrency? Okay, uh, a lot of people always ask me about cryptocurrency. I do not have a single cryptocurrency. I have no interest in investing in cryptocurrency. Maybe because, I mean, I've tried to understand it. Uh, I, I do understand a little bit about it. I like the technology behind it. But my biggest problem with cryptocurrency is that um, it doesn't generate a yield. It doesn't generate a uh, cash flow. It doesn't generate income. Not only that, uh, it is used by criminals. Basically, Bitcoin is something that a lot of criminals like to use because it's not traceable. And something about that doesn't sit well with me. Um, and... So I don't know, maybe someday I'll invest in Bitcoin or Ethereum, but uh, there's so many cryptocurrencies out there today. Like, which is the one, you know? Um, Bitcoin seems to have established itself quite well, but I see so many other uh, new cryptos coming up all the time, and then people are staking, staking each of these to, to, to grow. And I'm asking myself, how, how on earth is it ABC? You know, recently I heard there's an Umbridge coin in Singapore, and then there's Dogecoin, which is a joke. Um, they started as a joke writer. And then Elon Musk, you know, uh, that's why I don't like some of the, his antics. Um, he, was making a, he was making a joke out of it and he knows it's a joke, but unfortunately, he is quite an influential person. And when you are influential, it comes with some, a level of responsibility. Uh, and there are people who have invested heavily in some of these cryptocurrencies because of what Elon Musk or there's this other guy who's on Shark Tank has been touting, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm not comfortable with that, you know, because they talk about it, it talk up the price. And then recently, uh, Elon Musk decided that Tesla 
or is it just yesterday, uh, he announced that Tesla will no longer accept Bitcoin as payment for the cars and then Bitcoin is down 10% today. Uh, and then last week, he said that Dogecoin is a hustle, you know, meaning it's a fraud or, 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 or something. Um, not, okay, maybe I shouldn't use the word fraud, but he used the word hustle. Um, so be very careful, okay? What, the underlying thing is this. It doesn't, it's not just about cryptocurrency, uh, but it's something that I learned very young, at a very young age, which is if you don't understand, uh, don't touch. Okay? If you don't understand fully, don't invest. You know, the, the, I deliberately chose O'Reilly and Church and Dwight because these are companies uh, where the business model is very easy to understand. Almost a housewife will understand what they do for a, as a business, okay? So, or, or anyone. So, yes, maybe the numbers, you will need some, some training and some technical training, but the business is not uh, difficult to understand. So, whatever you invest in, Unless you're able to explain to a 10-year-old or 12-year-old uh, with in one paragraph, uh, uh, maybe just stay away from it. Okay. Okay. okay thanks, uh, Joshua. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that question was from Jeremy, who's also in our Zoom call. <laughs> okay. Well. So I thought I thought he looked familiar, but I don't know why he asked on Facebook Live. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but anyway, um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and uh yeah, I think uh, we've learned a lot from you today. Thank you for being open to share. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so if any one of us will have more questions, uh, how can, can we, can we uh, keep in touch? How can you keep yeah, in you touch? Yeah, you can. can I mean, what, one of the best ways would be to go to my webpage, uh, joshuafong.com. Uh, from there, you can, you know, there's a contact contact box or something you can you can reach out to me from there or you can join my facebook group i have a faith and finance facebook group maybe mark you can invite them into the group um the foundation group you can invite them uh and then you know i, I do write regularly you can ask questions um so the group that facebook group is particularly about faith and finance uh. yeah mm. maybe if i may also ask and uh, also why, why why do you want to Start this blog and maybe you can share a bit. Oh, I why you wanted to yes, yes, yes. What, what, what happened uh, was I think that will give a good context as well. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was um maybe one one to two years ago, my battery is running low, better plug it in. Uh one to one one, two years ago, I came across this guy called Dave Hodges, uh, who has a ministry called Kingdom uh Investors. And he I don't know, after listening to him, I just I, I, I was just praying one day uh, and, and, and I realized that, you know, at the end of the day, right, I can continue whatever I'm doing. I would, I would I'm assuming like, huh, I would get more and more wealthier. I would get more and more successful in the eyes of the world. But I got to the stage where I say, okay, um, that's not where I want to end up. Uh, and what I really want to do is I would like to have 5,000 people uh, at my funeral uh, who want to be at my funeral. So in order to do that, uh, I want, and then I missed, I need to impact their lives in some way. So one, one, and because my gifting and my passion is in the area of finance and investing, uh, so marry the two law. <laughs> so faith and finance. Because I do, I do realize that there are, there are a lot of uh, Christians who are, you know, very good investors, but I don't see a lot of them talking about money. Uh, and then there are a lot of pastors and, and teachers in the Christian world who, who, who will teach about money, but it's usually from the spec only of like tithing and giving money to the poor, that sort of thing. Um, maybe they're not trained in the investment area, so they tend not to, not to go down that line. So I realized, hey, how come there's nobody doing this, you know, and, and emphasizing the investment part, uh, especially from a, from a, from a faith-based uh, angle? So I decided, okay, lah, why don't I do it? Uh, and hopefully be able to impact some lives uh, and help them to really, uh, you know, manage their money well and be the Boaz, you know? I, I one person, not enough. Um, so as many Boazes are, are as, as can be around the world uh, who are able to... Uh, be successful uh, and use that steward the resources well to go and bless other people. So that's my my big hairy audacious goal. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your heart vision. And I think mm. uh, yeah, we, uh, we are so privileged to have your time today. Thank you for blessing us. You're most and, welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I okay, think uh, that's all. I think 
we have. And uh, yeah, please feel free to, if you are keen to continue to uh, keen about what Joshua has to say. I think uh, he's very open and very friendly. I found it personally very friendly and uh, that I've learned a lot so much from him. And uh, yeah, not only just about investing, but also about life and how, how we can still be faithful Christians and mm. to use our resources wisely. Okay. Yeah, and to be a good steward. Yeah. So thank you everyone. And thank you so much, Joshua. For your thank time. you very much. Yeah.